I'd like to start actually with a poem that is a love poem to librarians. It's where I discovered my widest freedom when I was growing up. And the library that I would frequent in Akron, Ohio was called the Maple Valley Branch Library. This poem is titled Maple Valley Branch Library, 1967. For a 15-year-old, there was plenty to do. Browse the magazines, slip into the adult section to see what vast tristesse was born of rush hour traffic, decolletes, and the plague of too much money. There was so much to discover, how to lay out a road, the language of flowers, and the place of women in the tribe of Mosh. There were equations elegant as a French twist, fractal geometries unwinding maple leaf. I could follow, step by step, the slow disclosure of a pineapple jello mold, or take the path of Harold's purple crayon through the bedroom window and onto a lavender spill of stars. Oh, I could walk any aisle and smell wisdom, put a hand out to touch the rough curve of bound leather, the harsh parchment of dreams. As for the improbable librarian with her salt and paprika upsweep, her British accent and sweater clip, mom of a kid I knew in school, I'd go up to her desk and ask for help on bareback rodeo or binary codes, phonics, gestalt theory, lead poisoning in the late Roman Empire, the play of light in Dutch Renaissance painting. I would claim to be researching pre-Columbian pottery or Chinese foot binding, but all I wanted to know was, tell me what you've read that keeps that half smile afloat above the collar of your impeccable blouse. So I read Gone with the Wind because it was big, and haiku because they were small. I studied history for its rhapsody of dates, lingered over cubist art for the way it showed all sides of a guitar at once. All the time in the world was there, and sometimes all the world on a single page. As much as I could hold on my plastic card's imprint, I took greedily six books, six volumes of bliss, the stuff we humans are made of, words and sighs and silence, ink and whips, Brahma and cosine, corsets and poetry and blood sugar levels, I carried it home past five blocks of aluminum siding and the old garage where, on its boarded up doors, someone had scrawled, I can eat an elephant if I take small bites. Yes, I said to no one in particular, that's what I'm going to do. Thank you. This poem is called Black on a Saturday Night, and it takes its title from a comment made by a gentleman who was being interviewed for a uh, PBS program on big bands. And this gentleman came from South Carolina, a white man who remembered going to hear some of the great black bands. And because he came from a segregated South, he said that they had to uh, segregate the audience. Whenever the black bands came into town, however, they would put the black audience on the ground floor, on the level with the band. Um, so that they'd all be together in these curious ways of segregation. And the white audience would be in the peanut gallery uh, up in the balcony. So he would look down over the rope and say, watch the couples dancing to the band and think it must be something to be black on a Saturday night. Black on a Saturday night. This is no place for lilac or somebody on a trip to themselves. 
Hips are an asset here, and color calculated to flash lemon, bronze, cerise in the course of a dip and turn. Beauty's been caught lying and the truth's rubbed raw. Here you get your remorse as a constitutional right. It's always what we don't fear that happens, always not now, and why are you people acting this way, meaning we put in petunias instead of hydrangeas and reject ecru as a fashion statement. But we can't do it. No, nah, because the wages of living are sin, and the wages of sin are love, and the wages of love are pain, and the wages of pain are philosophy. And that leads definitely to an attitude. And an attitude will get you nowhere fast, so you might as well keep dancing, dancing till tomorrow gives up with a shout, because there is only Saturday night, and we are in it, black as black can, Black as black does, not a concept nor a percentage, but a natural law. My daughter is now in graduate school. Um, this poem, however, is one where she was just born. My husband is German and we had her in Phoenix, Arizona, so uh, in a really wonderful facility where we could have her in the hospital, but we had midwives taking care of us. So it could be a natural childbirth unless something went awry. And there were lots of bets being placed on exactly what she was going to look like when she came out. This particular midwife who took care of us uh, was a wonderful woman. We could not quite figure out what she was, where she was from, but we took it as a good omen. Incarnation in Phoenix. Into this paradise of pain she strides on the slim tether of a nurse's bell, her charcoal limbs emerging from crisp whites unlikely as an envelope issuing smoke. I've rung because my breasts have risen, artesian, I'm not ready for this motherhood stuff. Her name is Raven, and she swoops across the tiled wilderness, hair boiling thunder over the rampart of bobby pins spoking her immaculate cap. She dips once for the baby just waking, fists punching in for work right on schedule, bends again to investigate what should be natural, milk sighing into one tiny vociferous mouth. Ah, she whispers, ambrosia, shaming me instantly. But no nectar trickles forth, no manna descends from the vault of heaven to feed this pearly syllable, this package of leafy persuasion dropped on our doorstep and ripening before us, a miniature United Nations. Just like me, Raven says, citing the name of her mother's village somewhere in Norway, her father a buffalo soldier. Now, of course, we can place her, an African Valkyrie who takes my breast in her fists grunting, this hurts you more than it does me, then my laugh squeezed to a whimper and the milk running out. <laughs> 